we are connecting and loading and building and growing. And with that, we are live. Let's see. Yeah, there we are. We're officially live. Okay. Welcome to this week's edition of the Black Freedom Lectures. It is so wonderful to see all of you here virtually. I'm very excited. Um, I'm Eve Ewing. I'm the curator of the Black Freedom Lectures. I'm coming to you live from the city, which is currently known as Chicago, which is the occupied lands of the people of the Council of Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Ottawa nations, as well as the Menominee and Ho-Chunk nations. Some of you may be joining. Uh, I'm, I'm like double duty today because earlier we had a uh, part of the Cultivating Black and Indigenous Futures in Education uh, conference that's going on this weekend, which is very dope. So if you're coming from there, it's good to see y'all again. Um, and we reminded everybody in that, audi in that audience today that Chicago is actually a city co-founded by a Black man and a Potawatomi woman. So we have been embodying Black and Indigenous solidarity here for a very long time. Um, I am thrilled, as always, for this evening's conversation. Glad to be here with all of you. And I want to begin by saying thank you to our incredible, intrepid team that has rocked with us week after week, Imani Legron, Sianda Mohutsiwa, as well as our ASL interpreter, the best in the land, Barbara Williams-Finley, and and our friends and colleagues at the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture, and the Mellon Foundation. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our special guest. Uh, I just found out that our guest tonight is going to be relocating to uh, the Chicagoland area, so that is dope. Um, Moya Bailey is an associate professor in the School of Communication at Northwestern University. Her work focuses on marginalized groups and their use of digital media to promote social justice, which we're going to be talking about a lot this evening. She is interested in how race, gender, and sexuality are represented in media and in medicine. She's the digital Alchemist, great title for the Octavia E. Butler Legacy Network. Shout out to all my Octavia Butler stands that I know are in the audience, um, as well as the board president of Allied Media Projects, which does amazing work. Um, Allied Media, if you aren't familiar, is a Detroit-based movement media organization that supports an ever-growing network of activists and organizers. Dr. Bailey is a co-author of the book, Hashtag Activism, Networks of Race and Gender Justice, which came out on MIT Press in 2020, and is also the author of the brand new book, Misogynoir Transformed, Black Women's Digital Resistance, which came out on NYU Press this year. And there are lots of great um, uh, events and, and live readings and things associated with the book. And so you should definitely check out Transform Misogynoir, one word, Transform Misogynoir on Instagram. Um, she's also an MLK visiting scholar at MIT this year before she comes and joins us here in the City of Wind. Um, Dr. Bailey, it is really an honor and a, and a pleasure to have you. How are you doing? I'm doing so well. It's such a pleasure to be here too. Yay. Um, well, thank you so much for your lecture. And, you know, uh, there's so much I want to talk to you about for, for those who don't know something that we've also mentioned is um, that you coined the term misogynoir, which is the title of your, your new book. So we'll get to that. But I want to begin with the lecture that you were um, so kind to share with us last week. And for those who didn't get a chance to watch it, feel free after this conversation to go check it out. It is available here on our YouTube channel. Um, but one of the things that you did in your lecture is you, you called, to, you invited us to account for the ways that black disabled people are disproportionately harmed and killed by police. But as you pointed out, often the disabilities of the people who've lost their lives um, or have been harmed by police have their identities as disabled people left out of the narrative. And I was wondering if you could start us off by talking about why you think that is. Absolutely. And again, it's such a pleasure and honor to be here and to be able to have this conversation and to think about it in the context of, you know, Black freedom is so important because disability, as we'll be talking about, so often gets left out of what we imagine for our revolutionary futures. And I think part of that is Black people have dealt with so much injustice and so much harm. And it's also the case that many of our disabilities are because of racist violence. So there's a need, I think, for some people to feel protective and not necessarily imagine or talk about uh, disability because it brings up uh, all of these different ways that racial injustice has exacerbated our experiences of disability. It's also true that when we have disabilities as Black people, we aren't believed 
And we also are not given the same kind of accommodations that white people are given. Uh, there's this example that I give uh, from a friend of mine. We were talking about someone trying to fundraise to get their emotional support animal to go with them on a trip. And just feeling some a little incredulity that people were willing to uh, put and extend this money forth for a support animal when you know other black disabled people are just struggling to actually get access to basic services. So there's a sense that the things that we need don't get accounted for. And the things that actually would help uh, black disabled people are not taken seriously and are not met with the same sort of interest and care as when white people are asking for um, their, their access needs. And something I talk about in uh, the article that uh, folks may have had a chance to read uh, with my friend and colleague, Isetta Mobley, was that there are ways that even doing the labor of disability care can lead to disabilities that are disproportionately managed by uh, black and brown women, particularly, mm -hmm. that a lot of the care work that happens in our society is done by black and brown women and their care of disabled people can also lead to their own uh, their own uh, disablement because of the care that they're giving to others. So it's a really complicated story and I think there are lots of reasons why for black people it's not so easy to just take on that identity. Hmm. Yeah, I really appreciate what you're bringing up at the intersection of disability, race, gender, and the economy and the way we think about our labor. Because as you're saying, you know, in a society that chooses, that doesn't have to, but chooses to um, offload, privatize, ignore the daily care of disabled people um, across the country. Um, as you're saying, much of that work falls on women of color, specifically black women, either in underpaid, you know, poorly paid, um, poorly benefited formal labor positions, uh, which are not recognized as, you know, important forms of, of work and which themselves can be subpar working conditions or happening in the home in private, right? Um, in, in ways that are that are not um, supported or compensated. So I really appreciate you um, drawing the intersection for us. And one of the things you just said that I think is important for us to think about is, I'm paraphrasing, I wish I could say it exactly how you said it, but you said, so often our vision of freedom does not include disabled people. And, you know, we had Barbara Ransby with us a few weeks ago and her, her book is Making All Black Lives Matter, right? And so that includes black disabled people. And one of the things I've been hearing from many black disabled folks, um, certainly for a long time, but I think amplified this year, is the ways in which protest movements and even what we think about as protests is, is not made accessible to disabled people. And I'm wondering if that's something that you see improving or getting better as more people are drawing attention to it, or if it's still, you know, something that, that people are, are, um, are, that we're not up to snuff with. Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those both ends that we love in women's studies and in critical theory. Like there are ways that we are getting better. There seems to be more understanding within movement spaces that we have to account for people's ability to take care of themselves, uh, worrying about burnout, also people doing more to check for access needs before an event starts, you know, even ASL interpretation becoming more standard in this pandemic moment. That is really exciting, but these are things that disabled people have been calling for for a long time. And it's unfortunate that the pandemic is really what helped move us to take these considerations seriously. And I do hope that they last beyond this moment, that this becomes a regular practice, that we can see the benefit of doing our work online, uh, the benefit of having conferences that are both digital and in person and doing the extra labor to ensure that people have what they need and everyone can be involved. And one of my real teachers around this is uh, a, 
a black ally, um, the late Stacey Park Milburn, who was instrumental in the creation of disability justice as we know it. So disability justice organizers working to think through what do we actually mean beyond access? Because it isn't just about uh, disabled people having access to certain spaces. It's also about changing the shape of our spaces to really center and put disabled people at the heart of what it is that we're doing. And that even shifts how we organize and what we imagine as freedom. So one of the ways that I've seen this uh, come about in kind of leaning into our radical imaginations is the uh, series Octavia's Brood, which was a sci-fi collection curated by Adrian Marie Brown and Walida Ermisha. And that um, collection included work by disabled activists trying to imagine what the world might look like in a future time. What does speculative fiction offer us for what we can see for disabled people in our futures? And I do think that's another reason why Octavia Butler's work is so generative is because she does imagine disabled people in the future. And sometimes when we think about you know, liberation and what black freedom looks like, so often it looks like a mirror of you know, the white capitalist patriarchy that we have now just with you know, black men at the top or black women at the top, but able cis het folks. And that's not the liberation that I think that we want or need. I think we need our radical imaginations to take us to a new way of thinking about what our world can look like and when you center disabled people, you can get there. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that because I think that it's an extension of something that I know is reflected in your work and that I, for me at least, that I draw from Black feminism, which is that when we look at our experiences and vulnerabilities at these intersections, it illuminates um, principles and ideas that free everybody, right? And so when we say, like maybe people need chairs or maybe people need water or maybe people need breaks or maybe people need childcare, right? When we start asking these types of questions um, in order to provide for specific people with specific experiences, it also opens up pathways to liberation that, that, are, that are collective. Um, and I'm really grateful for that. And I, I recognize that I think a lot of black disabled activists have um, just done so much in the last couple of years on this front. And I think that even reframing the idea of, you know, things that people need for access as somehow being extra, that unto itself suggests that there's a disposability, right? That people's presence is optional, that it's a bonus, that it's additive. Um, because we would never say, you know, coming from a poetry background, we would never call having a microphone extra, right? We would say that is the bare minimum that we need for this event to be successful. And so when we say that when we act as though the things, you know, the accommodations that people require in order to access an event are extra, it's saying that those people are optional um, and that's not okay. Um, so I'm really grateful. I think that framework offers us all so much. Um, now, so some of your work focuses on, you know, you, you proudly embrace the term hashtag activism um, and you used it um, in, in your lecture. And I think that for some people, that term is like a dismissive or derisive term. But as many disabled people have pointed out, offering very narrow definitions of what counts as activism can be inherently ableist. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about why that is and why hashtag activism is, is real activism and matters. Yes, and an example that I mentioned in the talk, uh, but I'm not sure that I did, but one of the early examples of hashtag activism and digital activism that I was aware of was a project called the Zola Story, which was a collective of queer women of color who were disabled, who found connection and organized online and it created an opportunity for them to connect to each other outside the presence of caretakers, outside the presence of family members. You know, so much of this labor that we've been talking about that gets 
heaped on to uh, communities and individuals to kind of address their own access needs. Sometimes churches are really involved in sustaining and supporting disabled people. You know, something I talk about a lot is that we don't have a lot of iterations of aid, care, and support on the left. Uh, the church has really been a stand-in for so many people for getting access to the support that our government doesn't provide. And, you know, that's helpful, except if you are a queer or trans disabled person and the church is the one who is providing you what you need, then it becomes uh, much harder to be out or to have access to the community that you might need. And so this- Or maybe just anyone who doesn't want to be under surveillance all the time, right? Or to have kind of monitoring, community monitoring. Exactly, exactly. And so the Zola project was really an opportunity for people to connect outside of those, you know, places where they might otherwise be surveilled. And that to me really sparked, I think was the genesis for a lot of this digital and disability justice movement sort of fomenting, people getting excited about what that could look like. And I'm really excited that made me excited about what the digital could provide and how hashtag activism really can move us into a direction where we're not just assuming that the only real activism happens outside and off the web, that there are really important contributions and networks and connections that can be created through digital space. And of course, those things ultimately ebb and flow. Even the idea that online and offline are these two distinct spaces right. really gets challenged by the digital activism that people are creating. It creates the networks and connections that then uh, move back and forth between what's happening in virtual spaces and IRL. Yeah, I, pardon me. I really appreciate that. And I think as you were talking, another example that came to mind for me that I think you, that you also mentioned in your talk is the hashtag disabled and cute, um, which I believe was created by Kia Brown. And I think that, you know, I think about selfies a lot and I think about how um, as a, as a millennial, um, right, there's a way in which the, the mode of the selfie is easy to kind of, um, you know, we take a lot of selfies, uh, people younger than us also, I think Gen Z is still taking selfies, maybe selfies are over now, but we take a lot of selfies and I think there's a way of kind of dismissing that and for that hashtag disabled and cute, um, it, it's, you know, it was p disabled people taking selfies of themselves, feeling cute and posting them. And it really provokes us to think about how rare it is for, for us to see those images of disabled people, right, um, in, in a way that is self-presenting, in a way that is celebratory, in a way that is not um, voyeuristic. Um, and that's not something that you're going to open any magazine and see. That's not something you're going to flip through any channel and see. And, and so those just kind of affirming self-curated, self-generated images. And so I, I feel like that's really an example of, you know, the ways in which that, that type of work is not possible without the internet. Um, and it's heartening Absolutely. for me to, your work inspires me because as I think about all the things I now hate about the internet, I'm like, oh, okay, there, <laughs> there are some good things. Um, <laughs> One question that we received um, over social media, uh, Ryan asked, when Black feminist or disability frameworks are misused and co-opted, how do we respond? And the question made me think right away about the say her name, the hashtag say her name, um, which I find often is co-opted in ways that make me uncomfortable. But generally, what are your thoughts on that? How do we respond when we see these, these tools of empowerment being co-opted or, or used in the wrong way? So... This unfortunately is, I think, a product of this moment, not to say that things haven't been co-opted before, but it's that much easier to do it because of the way things spread via the internet. In this digital moment, there's so much uh, ease with which something can be taken and taken out of context. So my sense though is we keep working on saying the message that we want and keep putting that forth. 
And when we see people who are saying it in a way that doesn't actually acknowledge the communities that were initially centered, that we make sure that those folks are called out or called in, depending on the context. You know, I, I do think that there's a difference between people who use something and it's a, you know, something where the intention was the intention was there to do the right thing and thought that they were actually lifting up as opposed to co-opting versus people who are actually trying to cause harm by changing the meaning of something. So I'm thinking specifically about uh, this moment we're having with critical race theory. So that is an intentional misreading of what critical race theory is. Or lack I of reading, as it turns out, no reading at all. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so just using this term to mean anything that has to do with race at the level of K through 12 education is completely ridiculous because critical race theory is not being taught in K through 12 at all. Not, so not. it, so I think that's definitely one of those cases where we have to call out and be very clear that this is a complete misunderstanding, uh, non-understanding of how this terminology is being used. But I don't think that we do enough on the left of pushing back and saying this is actually incorrect. Yeah, it's, it's hard. I, I think I struggle. I think you're right. And Oftentimes, because as you said, there's this proliferation of information, rapid fire, it's very easy for people to come across something and to not know its history and to move with good intentions, um, but in ways that, that often um, specifically exclude either, either things that were born with Black people, born among Black people for Black people that then get elided and or things that specifically were, you know, born within um, subcultures or subgroups of black people, whether that's black disabled people, black women, black trans people, you know, black queer people, whatever the case may be. And I think that that that's really tough. And, uh, you know, I um, in particular, the say her name one is is hard for me, because as you mentioned um, in your lecture, you know, it it emerged from the specific erasure, the specific an ongoing erasure of the murders of black women at the hands of police, right? Specifically. And, you know, we all went to lots of marches and events where people said, and our boys and our boys and our boys, right? And as though, as though th this never happened. Um, and so when I see people say, you know, hashtag say his name, I'm like, no, that's the whole point. The whole is like, but, but also you're meeting people at a moment of tenderness where they do have good intentions and where they are trying to uplift people who've lost their lives. And nobody wants to step in at that moment and be like, wait a minute. But, but if we all, but also if we don't, there can never be any specificity of talking about black women and black women's grievances. So that's just something I struggle with. I don't know how you handle it. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, been one of the reasons, one of the motivators for writing the book, Misogynoir Transformed, was that I felt like the term was moving in ways that didn't really acknowledge the history and the context from which I created it. And there was a rewriting in terms of how people were using the term. Uh, there's a way that people say where racism and sexism meet. And that's not the whole story. It's specifically anti-Black racism and sexism. And it's also the case that misogynoir affects not just Black women, but people who are read as Black women, often misread as Black women. So I'm including our agender, gender variant, otherwise gender expansive folks who are misgendered when they are called Black women, but also then experience misogynoir because of that reading. So I think to the degree that we can, we continue to say, this is what we mean. This is how we want this to be interpreted and used. And I don't think that that is a 
I don't think that there's anything wrong with continuing to say that over and over, over and over. Although yeah. I bet maybe you were like, oh, I could have written. Another, I got to explain this to y'all again. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I want to come back to misogynoir in a second. Um, but first I want to actually, no, let's just go to that question. So, okay. you know, many people do know you first and foremost as the person who, who coined this term. And I think it's because much like intersectionality, um, it's very powerful when we receive language for something uh, that we have always experienced and understood, but have not had the words for, right? Um, and Audre Lorde talks about, right, like the, the harms that are done against us that we are unable to name. And so just to say the full title of the book for those that um, should be on the lookout for it, the book is called Misogynoir Transformed Black Women's Digital Resistance. And the term really gave us just such a much needed language for these forms of contempt, anti-Black racism, discrimination directed at Black women. And I want to know what through lines do you see between the work that you do in Black disability studies and your work in Black feminism, because, and, and if you want to include digital humanities in there too, for sure, but just what, tell us about what do you see as the, the envelope or the, the through line that connects your work? Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's the Kambahi River Collective statement for me always, you know, if Black women were free, it would necessitate the end of all these structures of oppression and when I think about Black women, the people that I think about are Black disabled women, uh, Black people who are the most marginalized. And the through line is really one of connecting our struggles and the people who are in the most vulnerable positions uh, across the board. There's a real connection between those of us who are marginalized based on ability, based on race, based on gender. And again, just because you are members of those communities doesn't necessarily mean that you automatically have this leftist politic. Right. Uh, I think we can think of the person that I think of and that I mentioned in the talk, Madison Cawthorn, you know, is really a a scary example of how, you know, having a uh, disability doesn't necessarily give you disability politics. Mm. And for me, that becomes an important way of thinking about where we want to go. What is our goal as people who are moving towards freedom? Who are the people that we want along the journey? And it's less about identity. It's more about affinity. And I've found affinity with other people uh, across lines of race, gender, et cetera. And one way that our affinities show up is through uh, a connection and desire for another world, another way of relating, and one that does not position privileged people as the people who should be at the top of any hierarchy. And so for me, that's, that's the connection between disability justice and Black feminism, a real need to center the stories and the lessons from people who are constantly getting the short end of the stick when it comes to the world we inhabit. And I'd add that one, when we think of Black feminists, before Black feminists who shaped the way, there's often a disability story there mm -hmm. that isn't always told. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about Sojourner Truth. I'm thinking about Harriet Tubman. I'm also thinking about um, Audre Lorde. Yep. All of these stories that could be interpreted and understood through a disability lens, but haven't been because of our tendency to erase disability within our community. There are, and of course, you know, my favorite, Octavia Butler, there are these stories of disability that are part and parcel to their own theorizing, even if it isn't named as such. And something you pointed out in your lecture is that specifically, we live in an ableist world. We live in a world that erases disabled people generally, but specifically for black people, many of us have um, 
a, internalize a very ableist narrative about resistance or resilience, not resistance, resilience or overcoming, right? Um, and, and as you pointed out, the fear of being du doubly stigmatized, but also when we deny the reality of, of those people's lived experiences, which includes the experience of disability, we are denying ourselves a fuller picture of not only those particular individuals, but you know, what our movements and what our worlds could look like. So I think that that's just really important. And I, how do you, how do you balance that though with, um, you know, the potential that there can be disparity or discrepancy between how people define themselves, um, right? To, to quote Audre Lorde, right? If I didn't define myself for myself, uh, I'd be chewed up by other people's fantasies for me and, and buried alive, right? And so, um, so how do, how do you manage that, especially when you do historical analysis, the fact that some people might not have identified as disabled? Yeah, I think it's important not to give somebody a label that they haven't given themselves. Uh, you know, there's all of this talk about Octavia Butler and her queerness. Is it real? Is it measured? How do we understand it? And how do we understand her sexuality? I mean, but the truth is Octavia Butler never identified as a lesbian, never talked about herself in that way. So it becomes important not to use that kind of language. But there are things that we can notice about her experience and the stories that she does tell about experiencing a deep, you know, a relationship to how people understood her as a very tall, dark-skinned woman who people read as masculine, that that definitely shaped her experiences, her sexual life, her romantic life. Uh, but to me, it becomes important to talk about the nuances, and again, those affinities that people have more so than an identity, more so than uh, giving someone a label that they haven't taken on for themselves. But we can see the story. You can look at the narrative and find elements of disability there and understand that this is a part of somebody's story, whether they identify with it or not. And I'd say that's something that's really recent, this idea of identity with some of these ways of understanding ourselves. You know, disability as an identity is relatively recent. Queerness as an identity is relatively recent. So what does it mean that we are taking certain aspects of ourselves on as identities that previously have been conditions or experiences, et cetera. And I think one of the reasons we do that is to find connection, to right. find kin. Um, but I think we have to remember that that's why people initially wanted to do it, uh, but that it isn't the end all be all and that there might be other ways to imagine and dream of, of futures. One of my favorite things to teach students is the work of Gloria Wecker and thinking about Mati work in Suriname, which is a practice among women uh, where they have romantic sexual relationships with each other. Uh, and they understand Mati work as a behavior, a practice, mm. uh, not in not identity. Not totalizing identity. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So it's something they do, not something they are. And just what does that you know, give us the possibility to imagine when we think of sexuality, how does that perhaps open up some other ideas about what our future relationships can look like um, that identity might foreclose. And you can see why there might be some tensions between like a very Western identity-based understanding of sexuality that comes into conflict with more uh, traditional aspects of sexuality that have some fluidity and some openness and definitely connect to queerness, but then get sort of um, short shrift because of how they are interpreted by a Western frame of what sexuality should look like. You know, what you're asking us to do is really hard and scary because <laughs> when you, when you, the, the thing about identities is exactly as you said, um, you know, 
is, is that it allows us a quick and easy way to identify our, our kinfolk allegedly, right? But there's a reason that we have the aphorism that everybody whose skin folk is not your kinfolk, right? Not all skin folk are kinfolk. And I think that that is a kind of quick colloquial way to, to really talk about what you're saying, which is that um, people can inhabit a certain type of identity without necessarily holding on to the politics um, that we assume accompany that identity. And I've been thinking about that a lot with, um, you know, when Issa Rae first said, I'm rooting for everybody black, it was like, haha, and it was great in the context in which it was said, which was the Olympic games and whatever. Um, but I actually more recently have been like, I'm not rooting for everybody black. I'm not rooting for black people who are actively engaged in harming and exploiting other black people. Uh, and I feel like that is really hard and scary to say, like if, if, you're, if your way of being is extractive or exploitative or hurtful towards the majority of black people who occupy a different, you know, differential power station in life than you do, we're not cool. Like I'm not on your side. And I think even just saying that out loud is, is, is kind of terrifying. And I wonder if you could talk more when you said, um, you know, people could be disabled, but not necessarily have a, have a disability politic. Could you just spell out for us more? What, what does that mean? And what does a disability politic mean to you that somebody might yes. have, whether or not they are themselves disabled? Absolutely. So again, I'll give the example of Madison Cawthorn just because he's been in the news right now. So Madison Cawthorn, young Republican representative, and Madison had a uh, a car accident that left him paralyzed. And that car accident changed his mobility, but it did not change his politics. So it did not give him a sense that, oh, disabled people actually have a lot to offer the world, that uh, disabled people have a unique perspective that should be listened to. Uh, Madison is still operating from a very conservative set of values that does not lift up what I consider to be disability justice principles that are moving at the pace of the slowest person within a group. Uh, also trying to think through how do we take care of one another? Uh, are we moving in a way that doesn't center capitalism? Are we being attentive to the ways that work as it's structured now can actually create disability? Are we also being attentive to the lives of people who don't fit an able-bodied understanding of what a life should look like? You know, understanding that just because somebody has a disability, whether that be cognitive or mental or physical, that their life is somehow less valuable or considered to be uh, not as good or worthwhile as somebody else's. And so we can see that in some of the legislation that he's already been interested in that has some of these eugenic undertones that we've seen before that definitely come from the right. So I would say that is somebody who is disabled but does not have a disability justice politic. And I can think about this also in the context of queerness and transness with Caitlyn Jenner running for, you know, governor. On an California. openly transphobic platform. Exactly. So Caitlyn Jenner, you know, an athlete herself, active in high school sports, wanting to deny that opportunity to trans girls. And of course, again, the right being very successful in mobilizing language and a idea of some rampant and wild number of young trans girls who are trying to be in sports in a way to upset the balance and take away opportunities from cis girls, which is, again, not at all the case. You know, we're talking about a handful of students who are trying to get access to what they need. But again, we cannot assume that just because somebody inhabits an identity that they have the politics and the political capital and ideas that support the group that they pretend to belong to.
Yeah. And I mean, that's the, the trans sports thing really gets on my nerves because nothing is fair about children in sports access. So I'm like, if you all want to do this, then we need to cut out all these teams that you pay to be on. But anyway, I'll let that go. Um, plus it's like the sanctity of elementary school sports must be the foundation of our very Republic must be, you know, kept in place. But, um, that's a rant for another time. I feel a way about it. But I think <laughs> your point is really important and we know this, right? We know, we see, women uh, in politics who do deeply misogynistic, patriarchal, <laughs> hurtful things that hurt other women every day, right? We see Black people that do deeply racist things. And I think what's so challenging about what you're, what you're demanding of us is that if we understand people through a, an espoused and enacted politic and not just through an identity, then we actually have to take the time to get to know each other and to be in relationship with each other and to analyze like, how are you moving and what are you doing in the world? And we don't get to just be like, rah, rah, this person is fill in the blank. And um, that's really hard. So it um, is. So thanks a and lot. <laughs> no, and I would say that that was one of the things that was so attractive to me about those early internet days. And when I say early, I'm talking about just 10 years ago, right? right? right. That, that we took the time. Uh, I'm doing a podcast in association with the book, and I've been interviewing people who were on Tumblr and on the blogs that I used to read. And one of the things that one of the people said, uh, shout out to Gorilla Mama Medicine, who was one of my early Tumblr blogger teachers, uh, one of the things that she offered was that in those early days, we were, we were really pen pals. Right. We writing back and forth to each other, there wasn't an expectation that you had followers. They were actually people that you were engaging with. You had people who were listening to you and you were listening to them. You went to their blog, you read, you commented, people commented back. There was an expectation of exchange. And reciprocity. I, and reciprocity and a sense that, you know, the things that you thought might change, right. you know, that, that there was room for uh, people to change their mind and also get more informed on a topic. Uh, one of the things I talk about in the book is uh, specifically the story that Danielle Cole tells about not really understanding colorism, coming from Massachusetts and being in a predominantly white environment and just experiencing racism, but not seeing how colorism was definitely impacting her world and actually listening to some dark skinned folks on Tumblr being like, there's a difference here. Right. Like the, even the kind of racism you experience as somebody who is lighter skinned is not the same racism that all black women, all uh, black feminine people are experiencing. So trying to educate people about what the realities are for different folks of us is not what's happening on the internet right now. No. <laughs> this is not what this kind of conversation has really changed as the platforms have changed and as time has gone on. Yeah. I mean, when you move to Chicago, I would, we should just get together and talk about this because I have a lot of feelings and it makes me really sad um, for, for all of the reasons that, that you just described. And I think actually to me, when I asked you earlier, what do you see as a through line in your work? The question of care um, to me is also a through line between black feminism and black disability studies and disability studies generally, right? This idea of how do we care for each other? And the questions that emerge become so different when, when um, caring becomes the basis of our work rather than winning or being right. Um, and that takes me to, you know, a, a minute ago, a couple of times in our conversation, you've already brought up um, capitalism. And not surprisingly, in our lecture series, um, the limits of capitalism and the harms of capitalism has been a recurring theme, as I think all of us right now are living through a time when we are um, re-examining our relationship to work and to labor and to how we sustain ourselves. And disabled people have been at the forefront for a long time in demanding that we think differently about those relationships. Could you tell us what Black disability perspectives, what Black disabled perspectives have to teach us about capitalism, or you might say about un uncapitalism, right? Um, what are the ways in which a Black disabled lens um, challenges capitalism? Yes. One of the things that has been a really important part of left movements has been 
labor organizing. And so I am thinking about how we move beyond the idea that we should be organizing to have uh, better jobs, but also questioning, do we need jobs at all? Like, what is our responsibility for how we live in society? I mean, ultimately, I think that the system that we've set up is unsustainable, and we're seeing that now. Uh, and disability justice really gives us the opportunity to say, you know, our ideas about labor and the idea of just work needs to be questioned. Do we need to work at all? What is your life worth living if you cannot work? Right. Don't you deserve to live whether or not you can contribute to a capitalist economy? Is your life worth saving? And so often the way that disability gets understood is through that idea of lack. This person cannot contribute to the economic infrastructure of this country and therefore they don't deserve to live. That is definitely what capitalism and nationalism will teach us, that your citizenship is content, is built on, predicated on your ability to contribute financially to this system. And that is an important interruption that Black disability justice, that Black disability studies really asks us to consider what is the value of Black life if it's not a laboring life? Mm. What is the value of our ability to be understood as inherently worthy without our ability to contribute to a economic system? Are there other ways that we understand people's importance beyond their ability to contribute labor or contribute to a machine that is always going? And I think that takes us back to the other thread that you pointed out in my work, which is care, that there's a level of interdependence and care that disability justice offers us that asks, asks us to shift our understanding of where we see people's importance. There are things that people can do, lessons that we can learn from disability justice that are somewhat hidden or harder to see if we're centering able-bodied folks and able-bodied expectations of ourselves in terms of productivity. You know, so much of disability justice is about process mm. and repetition. And there's this great quote from Nikki Finney that repetition is holy. So I think about the things that we do every day and the lives of people who have regular routines that are part of their survival, that that repetition is a way of saying this is important. My life is important and these routines and regular practices are part of showing that. And what are our, what are the things on the left that we're willing to repeat and to continue to give energy to? Uh, I think that's, that's where we should be looking and where we should be going. Yeah, I really hope that anybody watching this who, if you have shared an inspirational quote on Instagram about how you need to rest more or about how you are more than your labor or more than your productivity, that you go give your flowers, your library card, your bookstore money to some really powerful disability justice advocates and authors and thinkers and creators who have been calling on us to do this for a very long time, right? And um, and I, I think that in particular, in a moment where uh, this, the, the, the specter, the tantalizing um, specter of black capitalism is like beckoning people as in making promises towards freedom that I, that I don't think it can deliver on. For me, the question is always is exactly as you said, if, if we're going to say we have to hustle and we have to buy back the block and we have to bank black and we have to do this, that and the other, what is our vision for, for thriving, survivance, joy and celebration for people who cannot and perhaps never will be able to contribute um, to an extractive economic system? 
And that includes all of us when we get old, right? Like what, what is our vision for, for our elders? What is our vision for disabled people? What is our vision for children? People who for whatever reason are not um, able to contribute in this way. And as you said, what is our vision for a celebratory and inclusive uh, principle of liberation that, that includes those folks? Um, yeah, another thing I obviously feel a way about. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm going to ask you one more question. It's it's a it's a little bit of a softball um, for those who are who are watching. Uh, and I didn't prep you on this one. Sorry. So this is just like Professor okay. off the dome for those. Yeah, who, yeah, yeah. For those who are listening and are interested in in learning more about these movements, um, other than of course your incredible work, um, could you just tell us one or two texts if people just felt called out by my Instagram comment and they wanna go read more about black disability justice or disability justice more generally, where should they start? Yes, wonderful. So there is a great text that I was privileged to be a part of that was uh, created, edited by Christopher Bell, and it's called Disability, uh, Blackness and Disability, and that is available everywhere, and uh, it's distributed through Vertlag Press, and I would also suggest a wonderful special issue of a Black Studies journal, uh, which I am not remembering the name, but it's, um, the editor is Tari Pickens. And it's a really wonderful collection of some Black disability studies work. And just for disability justice work, I would also suggest people look at Leah Lakshmi Saram Singha's work, um, her book Care Work. And uh, I mentioned Stacy Park Milburn. Stacy Park Milburn and Andrea Levant did this incredible. Uh, series of videos, which the video that I uh, offered you comes from in connection with the film Crip Camp. And if you haven't watched Crip Camp on Netflix, I suggest you start there. It's a wonderful opportunity to learn more about disability justice organizing that happens organically when we are in community with each other. You know, what is the power of having our own spaces to create and foment the ideas that we need. And so this disability uh, summer camp actually led to some of our favorite disability actions that came in the decades that came after, after that camp. It really gave those young people an opportunity to grow and learn some organizing and even some sense of themselves as deserving of being organized for and being organizers themselves. So I highly recommend that documentary and the accompanying work and uh, workbook that was created for it, uh, spearheaded by um, Bianca Loriano, uh, who has a whole accompanying uh, curriculum that goes with Crip Camp. So if you check out Crip Camp, Dot org, you can find all of the things that you need to get started there. That's really powerful. And I, I know, you know, I used to be a sixth, seventh and eighth grade teacher. And so I know a lot of teachers are already starting to think about what they're going to do next year. In addition to all the critical race theory that previously was not being taught in K-12, but now <laughs> I guess it's going to, since, since y'all don't like it, we'll just slide that in there. But I, I really hope, um, you know, when I used to teach students about the civil rights movement, we also talked about other social movements. We talked about the American Indian movement, the queer rights, you know, Stonewall, and we talked about disability justice. And I, I really invite educators who may be watching this to use the resources that you just recommended because everybody loves a documentary and a teaching guide. That's a great place to start. And I was able to just look up um, the special issue that you mentioned, assuming I got the right one, is Blackness and Disability. This is the remix. Uh, does that sound right? Yes. Okay, great. That's it. That's in the um, a special issue of the College Language Association Journal, and the author, the the editor was Tari Pick Pickens, um, which is T H E R I. Um, Dr. Moya Bailey, I am so excited that I got to speak with you tonight, and I I hope that everybody will check out your book once again. The full title of the book is Misogynoir Transformed: Black Women's Digital Resistance, um, and please follow Dr. Bailey on Instagram to see lots of amazing book events that are coming up. That Instagram account is Transform Misogynoir, so Transform 
And then misogynoir, M-I-S-O-G-Y-N-O-I-R. You can also follow Dr. Bailey, Moya ZB, Moya Z is in zebra, B is in boy on twitter.com if you are still subjecting yourself to the nightmare hellscape that is Twitter. Uh, more power to you. I want to say thank you to Dr. Bailey for being here with us. And thank you, as always, to the greatest team in the known multiverse, Imani Legron, Sianda Mohutsiwa, our ASL interpreter, Barbara Williams Finley, and our friends and colleagues at the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture and the Mellon Foundation. I am Eve Ewing. This has been the Black Freedom Lectures, and I hope to see you all soon and take care in the meantime. Thank you so much. Bye.